Hello, welcome to Talk Wildlife. And today I have with me Andy Musgrove. Andy is a BTO director. Okay. Uh, also, sorry. Associate director. Associate director. Oh, well, <laughs> let's not split hairs. Associate director at the BTO. But um, what I'm going to talk to him about today is his county recording. Um, we won't say career, but his, his county oh. recording exploits, because his, his county recording covers a fascinating group of species that um, not many people really know a lot about, and that's sawflies. So first of all, hi Andy, how are you doing? Hello, I'm very good, thank you Alan. Excellent, I'm, I'm glad you're just an associate director, whatever one of them is. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll go straight into it. I'm going to share screen. Um, because what I want to do is give people an overview of what sawflies are, where they fit in life, um, how they live. And then I do want to talk to you about county recording towards the end, because I think, I mean, I, I do say it quite a lot. That there's two things I tend to harp on about. One is education and the other one's recording. Um, so we will do a little bit about, you know, how people can actually help you, not only you in Norfolk, but county recorders across the country and hopefully the similar people across the world that they can help. So I'll share screen first of all. Right. So everybody knows a fly, everybody knows a hoverfly, everybody knows a dragonfly. But here we have sawflies and not a lot of people know them. Um, and I have to admit, I'm one of them. I know very little about sawflies. So can you start off just by giving us an idea of what they are and where they fit as opposed to other flies? Right. So the very first thing to know about sawflies is they're not flies, uh, as indeed aren't dragonflies or indeed butterflies. Um, so sawflies are actually more closely related to wasps, wasps and bees. They're in the what we call the order Hymenoptera. Um, and uh, they're very they're a very early sort of um, offshoot of the uh, group of insects that uh, later evolved into bees and wasps. Um, and how do we tell those apart from the, the what we call the true flies? Well, the, the, the true flies or the diptera, they have um, one pair of wings. Um, and the wasps and indeed sawflies have two pairs of wings. Now, I've picked a photo here that doesn't show the numbers of wings very well, but we'll come on to a photo that does show the number of wings later, I'm sure. Um, but but take it from me, this, this insect here has four wings. Um, now, the, the, the thing to sort of differentiate them from, particularly these black and yellow ones, although they're not all black and yellow by any means. Um, so, you know, why is, why is that not a wasp? Um, and, the, and one of the main differences there is if you look at the sort of back part of the um, the insect, what we call the abdomen, um, and where it joins onto the thorax or the middle part of the insect, it's quite a broad connection. So you don't get that thinning or wasp waste uh, that you tend to see in a wasp or, or, or indeed a bee or an ant. Um, so that is sort of one of the main differences between sawflies and, uh, and other hymenoptera or other wasps. Um, it's not always easy to see that, um, admittedly. Um, one of the problems, there are many problems with identifying sawflies, which I'm sure we'll, we'll cover. Um, one is that they don't often show their abdomen very well and, and as, as helpfully as this particular insect here, and they often rest their wings over the abdomen. So you can't really, really see that, but um, this photo shows it quite nicely. Right, okay, well, I've got to ask because you brought them up. Um, they're in the same family as wasps, they're in the same family as ants, so do they bite or do they sting, or neither? Uh, they don't sting. Um, the bigger ones can give you a bit of a nip if you happen to hold them, but not many people do hold them. <laughs> That's quite an unusual thing to do, and you probably deserve it, quite frankly, if you are. Yeah. Um, so no, they're, they're in, uh, as adult insects, well, you know, as any, any stage of the life cycle, they're entirely sort of harmless to people. Um, there's a very, very big sort of um, scary looking one called the, which we call the horn tail. It's got a huge pointy bit sticking out the back end and they're also totally harmless. Right. So the horn tail is that that's a sawfly then, not yeah. an ichneumon wasp. Yeah, that's so, yeah, they're easily confused. But um, ichneumon wasps are another group of, of hymenoptera, another, another group of wasps. They have, though, again, the ichneumons have the, the narrowed wasp waist. 
Um, right. So they they do all the things with their their pointy pointy end. <laughs> <laughs> so just to put the the pointy end into uh, context, so the pointy end is the ovipositor. That's what they use for laying eggs. Um, <laughs> Am I right with that? Is that the same in this in this case? Yes, um, but um, this comes to the other part of the name. So I say they're not flies, but they do have sores. Um, so, or at least half of them do. The females have what we call a sore, and actually the, the word sore is is really good. Um, so I think is it our next? It might be. It might be a couple of pictures on, but we'll come we'll come on to looking at the sore in, in a few pictures time. Right. Okay. Well, let's move to the next picture then. Oh, it is this one. OK, that's fine. That's good. Right. Yes. Yeah, so what, what do we see here? Oh, I probably should tell you that, that because some people might be interested. The picture on the first of the that we saw first, um, that was a sawfly called Tenthredo temula. And I should warn those um, people who are scared by scientific names that most sawflies don't have English names. Uh, a few have some names that have been attached, but there's no official English names for, for any sawflies, really um so i'm afraid we just have to live with that for the moment um but this is tenthredo temula and it's 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 quite a common thing um and that distinct pattern of yellow on the abdomen there that is completely diagnostic for this species so if you see one with that sort of u-shaped pattern of, of yellow that is tenthredo temula right okay so let's right. let's go back to the next one yep this one is Arj Pagana, and I might be pronouncing the Latin wrong. Um, you know, nobody knows how to pronounce this, the, these scientific names, but I, th that's how I pronounce them. Um, it can be called the la large rose sawfly. It can be called the, I've seen the name, dark horned. Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. The dark shouldered rose fuse horn. There's all, you can make up whatever name you want, really, because um, yes. there aren't any official ones. Anyway, this is Arj Pagana, and this is probably in most people's gardens or, or, or in a nearby park or whatever. So it is on a, a, a plant of rose. I photographed this in my garden yesterday. Um, and you'll see it's doing something odd with the end of its abdomen. There seems to be a dark area that it's it, it attached. And what, what's happening there is using its saw um, to cut into the rose uh, in which and then it's going to lay its eggs in there. So we know this is a female because it's doing this. It, and the saw is, is, is basically like the you think like the sting of a bee or the or the longer ovipositor of, a, of an ichneumon, ichneumon wasp um the saw actually when you look under a microscope looks very much like like a human saw it's it's this long thing with jagged edges and, and it is used for exactly the same purpose for cutting into vegetation yeah so that's that's why it's called a saw fly although it's not a fly it does have a saw right okay <laughs> not confusing at all okay <laughs> um and then we've got another one here now yeah it's, it's it's weird because before because i've only just seen these pictures and i've just seen that last picture you showed me and now that i can see this picture it, it almost looks like and i might be wrong but it almost looks like the saw is inside the leaf is that right it is yeah it's doing All the right. same thing so this is this is another one this one's called pristifora testacea um, it's on a birch leaf, a little birch sapling that I, that's in that's growing on my drive and um, grown up from self seeded. Uh, and I walked past the other day and noticed it had uh, a sawfly flitting around and I, I watched for a few moments and it landed and started laying its eggs. And again, you're absolutely right. It's it's got the saw um, embedded in the edge of the of the leaf here. Um, and that's where it's laying its eggs. And presumably it's doing that to keep the eggs uh, slightly safe from predators and from parasitoids. And, and that will keep them a, a little bit sort of hidden. Um, but yes, this is a this is a birch feeding species. You can see, you know, it's a, you know, it's a small, small birch. So obviously the leaf's not very big. So it's quite a small insect. Um, yeah. I don't know, five or six millimeters long. Um, so yeah. what, what are the what's the sizes of these? I mean, we're talking sawflies, and you know, uh, how big do they get? How small? Well, the the biggest ones. The British ones, I mean, to be, oh, I'm saying the British ones, I don't know anything about ones in other countries at all, really. Um, the horn tail I mentioned is, is is one of the biggest, it's several centimetres long, but that's that's quite unusual. Most of the sawflies in Britain, um, some of the, the, the more meaty ones, you'll maybe sort of 11 or 12 millimetres, down to the smallest ones, two millimetres. So quite a lot in the sort of half a centimetre sort of range, really. Um, right. So you do need 
to have your wits about you to see a lot of them um, and you do need special sort of techniques to find them and you do certainly need um, magnification to identify a lot of them. And this might sound like a really weird question, but it might help people find them. Do they buzz? That's a good question. No, uh, most of them don't buzz or not, not to my ears anyway. Um, a, a few of them can, uh, some of the, the bigger ones. So there's uh, the uh, one called Simbex, uh, one genus called Simbex. They're quite big, chunky things and they do have a buzz, yeah. Right, okay, so here we've got um, a sawfly female laying an egg inside yeah. a leaf. Yeah. And then we've got, we've moved on to the larvae because their yeah. life cycle is very similar to something like, you know, people would know a butterfly yeah. know, lays eggs, has a larva. They then pupate to the pupate. Yeah, you're, you're right. So they, they lay their eggs, the eggs hatch into larvae. And um, unlike a lot of if you if you sort of know anything about bees and wasps sort of in their nest, they're sort of more grub like things. But but these are more like a caterpillar, really. They they've got a slightly different number of um, what we call the pro legs, the little sort of sucker like legs at the back. And their eyes are a bit different to, uh, uh, you know, butterflies sort of caterpillar. But otherwise, superficially, they look quite like a caterpillar. Yeah. Um, this one is, um, I've, I've photographed it here on a bit of bracken. This is a, a bracken feeder called Strongylogaster multifasciata, another big long name. Um, uh, doesn't have any say it. Sorry. Um, I think that's what it is. Anyway, I, I found this a few days ago on a bit of bracken, and, and I think that must be what it is. Uh, but yeah, they, you're right. They they feed, they munch munch away. Uh, people will know that sawflies, some sawflies in in gardens, can be quite destructive on certain plants, and they can feed very rapidly and, and defoliate a plant quite quickly. And then yes, they will. Um, they'll sort of spin a bit of a cocoon, and and eventually pupate, uh, and then the adult will appear. Most of them have one generation a year, um, and in fact, most sawflies the adults can really be found in the sort of early part of the summer, the spring and the early summer. So April through to June is really when you need to be looking for sawflies. And after that, they get quite thin on the ground. Uh, sorry, Andy, is, is that in their adult form or in their larval that, form? In their adult form, sorry, yes. The adult, adult sawflies mostly April through June. Um, and then obviously the larvae a, a bit later. Um, and uh, a handful have more than one generation a year, but most of them in Britain seem to just have one generation a year. Right. OK, and here we can see you said this is a bracken feeder. So uh, with something like, say, hoverflies, you get some of them that will um, predate. So as larva, they'll, they'll predate. Yeah. It, uh, are they purely vegetarian sawflies? Pretty much. They're, 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 you can think of them as veggie wasps. Yeah, they're um, mostly um, vegetarian as larvae. I I think there's, I think I was reading up on this, I think there's one or two that do, that are a bit more omnivorous and will just sort of munch anything they come across. Um, some of the adults um, will just sort of take nectar or, or pollen, but a few of the big ones will also eat other insects as well to sort of fuel them in their sort of adult stage. Um, but that, that's a bit variable. But most of the larvae are, are, are plant eaters, like, like you know, most moth and butterfly caterpillars, yeah. Right. OK. And we'll we'll come to sort of numbers in a minute. Um, I just want to sort of keep talking a little bit about the life cycle because they've got a fascinating life cycle. I mean, you know, here you've got what I would say is quite a big larva of a sawfly mm -hmm. because what I would be more used to and not necessarily this one, because this this again, this this is as you put it, what do you call it? A leaf? Cutter, well, it? this is this is a really quite an interesting one. There's quite a story about this one. But yes, I mean, in this case, you know, it's quite easy to find because of the shape that it's making in the leaf. But it's not what we call a leaf mine, which we'll come on to next. It's, it's yeah. just the feeding damage on the leaf that's made a distinctive pattern, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. Go on. Sorry. No, go on. Go on. So I'll tell you a bit about this one. This is um, this is quite a distinctive one and, and it's quite interesting. It's it's a new species to the the UK. It only appeared um, year before last, um, or maybe the one before that. I'm I'm getting getting my numbers mixed up. Um, but it's uh, it's a non-native species, invasive non-native. Um, it's native to East Asia. It's uh, appeared in in Europe for about sort of a decade or two, and it's only just appeared in in the UK. So this is what we call the zigzag elm sawfly. In fact, this is. This is a fairly well-known English name that you can use, a zigzag sawfly, if you like. 
Um, it, and you can see why it's called the zigzag saw fly. It makes the mark of Zorro on, on, on the leaves. Yeah. Um, and it, as I say, it's a zigzag elm saw fly. It feeds in, entirely on elm leaves. Um, so elms, as a lot of people know, were quite badly hit um, by Dutch elm disease back in the um, in the 70s, I think it was. Um, but uh, and, and a lot of people think that elm trees have disappeared and, and the big trees mostly have but elms are very very common as sort of hedgerow shrubs and they, they they're sort of still at the, at the low level they're they're abundant in a lot of hedgerows certainly around around norfolk so these feed on on the elm um and they make this really distinctive um uh cut shape and you can't you can't mistake this for anything else if you see this this shape here then um that this is the zigzag elm sawfly so it appeared, appeared three years ago for the first time, but it's already spread as far as the Midlands, sort of from, from the sort of southeast corner up to the Midlands. And presumably it will keep spreading and, and um, we don't know how far it will get uh, yet. OK, so this, this is a non-native invasive species. Is it, is it harmful to anything? You know, should we, I mean, very yeah. difficult to control something like that, but, you know, should we be worried? I don't know. I mean, you know, people obviously sort of get very concerned about some of these things. Um, first of all, there's absolutely <laughs> nothing you could do about this, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, I think in some areas, I think I, I read in Italy, it, th this is one that has multiple generations a year. I think it, in Italy it's been recorded up to six generations a year. And the reason it can breed so fast is it's um, it, it, it reproduces asexually. It doesn't need males. In fact, quite a lot of sawflies do this. Um, so it doesn't seem to have that many generations a year here in Norfolk so far, maybe two or three uh, from what I'm seeing. Um, and no, it's it's not proving to be ultra abundant yet. Um, most insects like this get, um, their numbers get controlled by um, predators and in particular by parasitoid wasps, so ichneumon wasps and, and, and other small wasps um, that will lay their eggs in them. And at the moment it, it certainly I can find it if I make an effort to go out and find it, but I don't see it on every elm uh, by any means. Right, and you mentioned that, that that's diagnostic, that, that zigzag um, cut. So of the sawflies, is, are there more species that do a similar type of thing within a leaf? So not coming onto the leaf miners, we'll come onto that next, but <coughs> are there similar ones that sort of cut into a leaf like that? No, not, not a lot. Um, that I'm aware of. I mean, one of the, I should probably said this early on, one of the big things about sawflies and the interesting things about sawflies to me is that there's not a lot known about them still. There's still a huge amount to discover. Um, there are, you know, some people have spent, uh, you know, a lot of time working on these and uh, both in this country and, and, and elsewhere in the world, certainly continental Europe. Um, but to the general naturalist, that they're, they're not a very well-known group. And there's still a lot to, to discover. You know, there isn't a good book to sawflies. There isn't certainly isn't a good book to sawfly larvae. Um, I can find a, a sawfly larva and have very little sort of option of how to work out what it is. And um, so there's a lot, a lot still to discover. And, and um, but there are, yeah, you know, there's there's a few. There's there's one that feeds on older that has a distinctive cut as well. But um, it's it's really the leaf mines that are, are easier to tell. So just before we move on to the leaf mines, um, if somebody comes across what they would see as a caterpillar, how would they distinguish it from the caterpillar of, say, a moth or a butterfly? Or is, is that not an easy thing to do? It, it's about the number of what we call the prolegs. Um, so and I'm going to I'm going to remember this wrong. Yeah, that's right. If you go back there, you can see sort of uh, as with a, an adult insect, um, caterpillars have six real legs three pairs and they're yeah. the ones at the front but they've also got those little stumpy suckery things at the back um and this is embarrassing because i'm being recorded but i can't remember if moths have four or three pairs or or, or sometimes few i think they have four at, at a maximum don't shoot me if i got it wrong anyway sawflies have got more and you can see that there they've got like one two three four five six yeah. seven seven pairs so if you've got a load of, uh, of pro legs at the back it's a sawfly the other thing is that the you can and you can just about see it here is sawfly larvae have a, a well-defined eye so actually there you can see it's, it's also got a dark spot on the back of its head but just at the edge of the head there it's it's got a, a little dark eye yeah 
and um, and caterpillars don't set, tend to have such a well-defined little eye as that. Right. OK. And for somebody that's watching this that uh, might not have paid sort of very close attention to caterpillars before, the prolegs are the ones towards the back end. So if you look for the blurred bit of leaf at the bottom, um, there's very small blurred bit of leaf. And then if you go backwards from that towards the back end of the caterpillar, yeah. they're the prolegs. So the right front end, legs. Yeah. So you can see three front legs that look like they've got a little bit of an extra piece on them. That's the yeah. true legs. They're the so true that legs. Piece, yeah. There's the thorax. So you've got the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen where the yeah. prolegs are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Grand. Right. So now something that really excites me. Um, well, just another thing that really excites me because you know what I like. Everything in nature excites me. And that is leaf mines. And and I love this. I love showing when I'm at work, I love showing the schools and you know any any in fact adults as well. I think this is just fantastic. Yeah. So tell us about a leaf mine, because these are just incredible. I'll tell you about leaf mines. Now, now first of all, only a minority of sawflies make leaf mines, but by their nature they're quite easy things to record when you find them so they're, they're quite quite uh, quite interesting i first got interested in leaf mines by looking at moths years ago and when i was sort of learning about moths uh, i got you know interested by the the leaf mines that moths make but then I, I realized that some other insects do it as well and what a leaf mine is is um when an insect lays its egg on a leaf and then the larva hatches out and feeds not on the top of the leaf or the bottom of the leaf but in the middle of the leaf so uh, sandwiched in between the, the layers and and I think that the reason this is quite exciting to sort of people who've never noticed it before is because in our minds we think of leaves as two-dimensional shapes they don't have a thickness they're just a, they're like a we think of it like a piece of paper you know they're, they're, they're a flat thing and nothing happens between the middle and, and the top and then when you realize something lives in the middle that's like it, it's a bit of a mind expanding thing isn't it yeah absolutely i love as i say i love showing people leaf mines i, I say i don't identify any species because i don't pretend to be an expert at anything but um when you actually show kids these and say well look you know here's a leaf and this thing's actually living inside the leaf it's crawling yeah. around inside the leaf it, it's it just never ceases to fascinate me so how many, let, let, in fact, we'll talk numbers because I, I know yeah. we're, we're going on to goals, which is another thing that I've got into recently that fascinates me. But before we do that, let's just talk about numbers. How yeah. many different species of sawfly are there in the UK? Yeah. So um, as with most things to do with sawflies, the true answer is we don't know. Um, but there's something, uh, there's, there's probably at least 550. Um, a, a few new ones are continuing to be discovered sort of all the time. And there are probably others that, you know, once we start really deploying DNA techniques and so on, there'll be others there as well. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's up to 600. Unbelievable. Yeah. So a lot of people think, yeah, you know, to see vast numbers of anything, you, you've got to go to sort of South America and some of the rainforests and all the rest of it. But what you've just said is that it's between five and six hundred sawflies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and most of them and most of them are very little known. You know, so we one of the, the, the key sort of things that excited me about this, A, I like to learn about new things that that, that I don't know about and, and ideally not a lot of other people know about. So you kind of really feel you're pushing back the boundaries a bit. Um, and uh, and something else that I've entirely forgot what I was going to say, but <laughs> I'll come back. To Me, you think you might discover a new species? I I think that's not unreasonable. You know, the, the, yeah. that many people working on, the, you know, the, the, there's a, there's a group of us doing, you know, putting a lot of effort into sawflies. Um, I got when I started looking at them seriously three years ago. Um, uh tony irwin who you you may know sort of um ex norwich um uh castle museum and sort of norfolk's one well, of norfolk's premier sort of entomologist he mostly works on on real flies on dipter and but he had a load of sawfly specimens um that he collected over the years and so he gave those to me to sort of work through which is really good to sort of sort of develop my sort of techniques and skills and so on and there was one of those I didn't seem to be anything that I could find in any of the keys. Um, so keys are, for, for those who don't know, they're, they're a way of identifying um, species by a series of questions. Does it look like this or does it look like that? Does it look like this or like that? So that's a key. Uh, anyway, there, I've got 
I've got some of the keys and, and, and one of these sawfly specimens didn't seem to key out to anything. Um, so that was quite interesting. And being a relative beginner, I assumed that it was me doing something stupid. Um, but I kept trying, kept trying. And, and eventually I took it to an event where um, there was a, a, another sawfly expert there. And, and he basically concurred with how I'd gone through the key and, and that we'd reached a dead end. Um, but what it turned out was, uh, he suggested, and we've since confirmed this, that actually it was a male of a species that's known in the UK, but we thought only the females occurred in the UK. As I say, some sawflies are mostly or entirely found as, as females and they reproduce asexually. Um, but he says, well, I don't know what this is, but maybe it's a, a hitherto unknown male of this species. And we went to the Natural History Museum and looked in the sort of world collections and yes found some specimens of male of this species that, that's never been recorded in britain so if you like that was half a new species for britain <laughs> right brilliant it brings me up to a question so something like dragonflies yeah um in the main you can differentiate a male and female by how they look basically yeah. um it's that the same with sawflies it you know it can yeah. Is because I mean to me that that just causes more confusion because so, then you've got yeah, <laughs> but, sawflies are actually one of the easiest things to tell about sawflies is whether they're male or female and that's if you've got them close enough and have a good view and so and that's because the female has the saw and the male doesn't yeah. and and you know the, the if you look towards the back end of a of a of a female sawfly it's got this saw that sort of is sort of vertically um, positioned in the abdomen. And the male doesn't have that. It's got like a horizontal plate that sort of covers the end of the abdomen. So right. with the appropriate view of the right bit, it, they're very, very easy to tell apart. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Now we come on to another thing that excites me. And this is something that I have sort of recently. Oh, do you want to know about those these leaf mines? <laughs> I'll just tell you. What, yeah, let's talk just, about just leaf mines. Complete, so I'll just tell you what they are. Um, it's just more scientific names, I'm afraid. But but again, there's potentially interesting stuff here. So. The one on the left, that's a field, a field maple leaf, um, a little, little sycamore, a little field maple. And the my, I photographed this this morning, actually. It's um, The name is Heterarthrus ruesnii, so it's quite a complex name. Um, and it only occurs, if you see, if you see a little mine like this in the um, lobe of a field maple, and that's what that is. Um, until a couple of years ago, there weren't any Norfolk records at all, but it, now I've been looking, it seems to be everywhere. Right. Um, the, the one in the middle, um, this is a leaf of Herb Bennett or Wood Avens. I uh, found this in the back garden. Um, this is uh, Metallus lanceolatus. It's another another little sawfly. And the one on the right, this is another elm feeder. And we don't, I don't know what this is. Um, there seems to be two species, possibly, possibly fewer, possibly more, um, in a genus, genus called um, Calliophanusa. And the books say that when, if you get a mine in the middle of the leaf like this, it's one of them. And if you get a mine at the other, uh, the edge of the leaf, it's in the, the other. But I'm not sure whether I believe that yet. So I'm still looking at these. Right. The other interesting thing, maybe for people who don't know leaf mines, you'll see there's a pattern of sort of black dots in each each leaf. If you look really closely, yeah. you can just about make out the, 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 the larvae. But the black dots are basically, the, it's what we call the frass, but it's basically the poo. Um, so the, the larva eats the inside of the leaf and then poos out a, 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 pa a pattern of dots. And sometimes that the, the form of the poo there is 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 helpful in telling what what the thing is, um, whether it's a, a moth or a beetle or or, or a sawfly indeed. Right. OK, I've now got I'm glad we didn't move on because I've got two questions now about yeah. leaf mines. Um, and the first one is looking at them, it looks like. You know, you can't tell from the one on the field maple, but on the other two, it looks like, OK, that looks like the work of one larva. So does the female just lay one egg on each leaf or would you get a, an instance where there are a number of larvae working on the same leaf? Yeah, it, it depends on the species. You Most of them, it seems to be just one on a leaf, but there are some where you get more. So there's two quite common ones on older which is common tree in sort of damp areas around here. Um, one of them, Fenusa dornii, you often get lots of them on the um, on the same leaf. Uh, and the other one, Heterarthrus, what is it, Vagans, um, you only get one. So that, that can be a, a helpful sort of diagnostic thing as well. 
Right. OK. And then the other question was. Clearly, they're eating. Yeah. And everybody knows what happens when you eat, especially now that I've been in lockdown and probably put on a storm when you, you get bigger. So these things here are inside a leaf. Is mm. there ever a point where they become too big to be inside the leaf? Do they actually come outside of the leaf? Yeah. So. Um, and I think this varies between different leaf mining and insects. Um, most of these, it seems that they they hatch out, they eat and they eat and they eat and they, eat and they get bigger and bigger and uh, and that's it. And and then either they, pup a few of them pupate in the leaf, but most of them sort of um, exit the leaf, fall down to the floor into the leaf litter and pupate down there. Um, I think some insects, and again, I might be talking nonsense here, um, may shed their skin a few times uh, and um and continue so you sometimes see shed skin in in leaf mines um exactly what's going on there i would need to sort of read up on um so although i might come across as a, an expert on some of this stuff i'm still an amateur as well still learning an awful lot there's just a lot to learn um yeah, but yeah. i'm just glad you're here to see all the latin names <laughs> <laughs> but i think you know it's, it, there's just a lot to learn as i say this 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 one on the right the and the elm leaf this is really common it's on every elm at the moment i must have seen hundreds of these this morning and I still don't know what species it is so oh wow and yes. I've not managed to find the adult um sawfly yet and I've not managed to rear it out yet they're quite hard things to rear and yeah so um yeah yeah just again for those that don't know what that means um that is basically yeah. getting one at this stage seeing it through its life cycle and then yeah. identifying it when it comes out the pupa as an adult yeah, that's right. And and you can do this with, um, I suppose, the school kids might do this with small tortoiseshell butterflies or large white butterflies and whatever. And they're not too difficult because you've got, um, uh, so say you, you find small tortoiseshell caterpillars on nettle, it's easy to give them loads more nettle. Uh, eventually they'll pupate and because they'll have multiple generations in a year, you don't often have too long to wait before the pupa then turns into a lovely new um, butterfly. Sawflies often are a bit more of a pain because they'll most of them wait a whole year. They seem to be really um, sensitive to different moisture levels. And so they obviously sort of work out exactly where they want to be in the soil structure and so on to get exactly the right moisture level. But if you just stick them in a plastic tub, then it doesn't tend to work very well. And yeah. in my experience, most of them most of them don't make it. So um, there are advanced techniques to doing this right with moisture and moss and all sorts of things but i haven't yet had the skills or indeed patience to do this properly right okay so what we're going to come on to next is the goals but before i do that quick question well it's it's, it's not a question because I, I think you sort of answered it earlier on um so when the pupate you know they, they've sort of dropped into the ground the, the dropped to the ground the pupate um, what a lot of people don't realise, and I know I, I talk mainly to people about the likes of red mason bees that you get in your bee hotels and things like that, is that the the pupa will either spend the winter dormant in the ground and then hatch, or in some cases they'll actually hatch and then almost hibernate through the winter as an adult. What's the case with sawflies? Do they, do they spend the winter as the pupa or as the adult? Well, as I understand it, and I might be wrong, most of them actually spend most of the winter as a larva in a sort of pre-pupal stage so they've spun a bit of a cocoon but they're still effectively a larva and then as the sort of spring comes on um i don't know march um they then do the, the building the pupa which is then the, the thing that they change body shape within um that's what I understand. I'm not quite sure how much variation there is within sawflies, but that seems and I think that is part of the reason why they're quite difficult things to rear and why they're so sensitive to moisture, because if you have like a butterfly or a moth cocoon, it's a pretty robust thing. It's it's a hard shell. Um, and so it's probably pretty robust to what you do with it. Whereas if you're still a, a, a larva in a, in a fairly flimsy cocoon, then the sort of level of moisture that you get is probably quite important still. Right. OK, and yeah, so that brings us nicely on to the goals because, you know, that again, <laughs> I, I got into goals, I, I got into goals via the Nopper goal. I think most people do. Yeah. Um, and I'm absolutely fascinated by them now. I've got the FSC key uh, and I've got a, a guidebook on them. 
I think a lot of people just they, they'll just think it's a disease on the leaf or whatever, and they, they won't particularly pay a lot of attention to them. But that to me, that's that's a beautiful thing. So mm. tell us what's happening here. What is this? So this is, I believe, um, the goal of, or indeed two goals, of a sawfly called Pontania triandri. Um, although Pontania proxima is, is the one that is much easier to find. So let's talk about that. It just really depends what type of willow it's on. So this happens to be on almond willow, um, but um, white willow is a much commoner tree. Uh, most of the sort of weeping willow type willows you see with long leaves. Um, if you look at them, this time of year, it's probably the easiest sawfly to record in many ways. Find a white willow, look at the leaves, and you'll find these little, they look like little beans, really. And and with this species, the gall is, is is approximately as prominent on both sides of the leaf. Um, so it's like it's been embedded in the leaf. And so what's going on here? Um, galls are a, if you like, a deformation of the vegetable matter, the plant's sort of own material caused by uh, another organism. So what's happened is the um, the sawfly has laid its egg in here and exactly how it works, I don't know enough about. I'm sure somebody studied this in great detail, probably works in all sorts of different ways, but I suspect it's some some, rea some reaction to a chemical that the, the sawfly has put in. The, the, the plant sort of defenses build up a, a level of sort of extra tissue around, around that. Um, and over millions of years because you know these are these are known to be sort of very sort of old sort of um, relationships these relationships are built up whereby um, the plant reacts in a certain way the insect benefits from that by having a safe place to live uh, a relatively safe place to live um, and in in there in that sort of um, uh, expanded area of sort of vegetable material plant material um, is a tiny sawfly larva just looks like one of those little caterpillary things that lives in there munching around and eating all that extra sort of plant material that's been sort of created um so it's 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 a really interesting um example of uh you know how the um the insects and the sort of plant have sort of co-evolved yeah yeah that Goals are just again they're endlessly fascinating. I mean, and and it's not just sawflies that create them. No. You know, there's wasps, there's there's fungal bacteria, there's fungi. Um, you know, a lot of people will probably have seen goals but not realised it because they think the nests, uh, and that's which is broom gall, which is a fungal bacteria, uh, yep. which is it's sort of wind. Uh, you know, the wind carries the the bacteria onto the tree. Only affects the silver birch. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yeah silver birch um so yeah I, I anybody that sort of hasn't seen an opera goal or doesn't know what goals are go and get a goal book have a look they're amazing things mm. so yeah the goals have just stolen the show you can keep your soul flat <laughs> right okay so yeah. speaking of sorry no go on yeah uh, yeah, yeah i was going to say speaking of soul flies so here we have one that you're also going to give probably a big scientific name to but uh, we mentioned earlier on between five and six hundred in the UK. Yeah, you're the county recorder for Norfolk. Yeah. So, how many have been recorded in Norfolk? <laughs> what do you think the answer is? We don't really know. Uh, <laughs> this, right. this is again one one of the really interesting things. You know, we we know really well. Um, you know, the birds of Norfolk, we know the butterflies of Norfolk, we, we're, we're really pretty good on the moths now, we know the dragonflies, we've got loads of people looking at the plants. But most insects aren't well known, in fact a lot, and a lot of the other invertebrate groups aren't very well known. Um, so this is one of the things that really fascinated me, you know, I, I've been interested in all sorts of different sort of um, taxonomic groups as it were, but I sort of wanted to sort of specialise a bit and um, I sort of latched onto sawflies because it was a big group of insects of which you know, the, the, the sort of knowledge base was really pretty sparse. So one of the things I did was um, I looked back at some really old, there's some really old papers that um, Tony Irwin put me onto in the transactions of the Norwich and Norfolk Naturalist Society. Um, the first one from 1888, uh, the first list of sawflies for Norfolk. Then there was another list published in 1906 or something. Uh, another one in 1914. They, they're obviously on a bit of a roll then. 
And then there wasn't anything published on sawflies in Norfolk till the year 2000. And, and that's that's basically it. So we've got four sort of lists uh, and not a lot else in between. Of course, in that time, people's knowledge of um, what makes a species has changed, which species are which, you know, what what names you give to them and so on. So actually comparing these lists is is really challenging and it remains really challenging because just because some guy in 1888 said he saw a such and such. It's not obvious what that actually now refers to often. Having said that, some of those, the insects um, that made up that list, the actual specimens are still retained in, in Norwich Castle Museum. So I have actually managed to look at some of those and um, I haven't had time to look in as much detail as I'd like yet. But for example, there was one, one sawfly that we've only got one county record for it, but I have seen the specimen uh, from 136 years ago and I can still key it out and it is that 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 species. So that is correct. <laughs> so yeah, there's some, there's some interesting stuff about the importance of uh, specimens here. But anyway, I digress. I have been doing quite a lot of catching sawflies myself, collating sort of modern records. And I think there's probably about 350 species known from Norfolk, give or take. But we are still finding lots. So I've just written up um, uh, uh, an annual report for, for, for what I and, and, and the number of other recorders found in the county last year. Um, and that included, uh, I think it was seven new species for the county um, just in, in, in one year. So there's a lot still to discover. And Norfolk is known for its diversity of habitats. It's yeah. Got numerous different habitats are there particular sawflies that because you, you've mentioned some of the sort of you know the willow and the elm and the, you know the field maple and stuff like that um so that's individual trees are there some that are specialist say specific habitats like the brex mm. so this is one of the other really interesting things about sawflies that sort of got me going because I got asked, Norfolk Norwich Nats have, have been doing a project on um, uh, notable species for Norfolk. And, you know, they, they come up with the swallowtail butterfly and, and, the, and the bittern and, and um, the common reed, for example, the reed beds and, and so on. And so I was asked early on, you know, which which Norf which sawfly species is Norfolk important for? And, and again, the answer is we don't know. We, we just don't know. We don't know the status of most species in Norfolk and we don't know the status of most species in the UK. So we can't really say yet for most species, you know, is Norfolk important for them? Are particular habitats important for them? And so on and so forth. So what I've been, I'm, if you like, my sort of primary interest at the moment is to work out just, you know, the status of some of these species. Are they common and widespread? Are they and easily seen. Are they common and widespread but not easily seen and so seldom recorded? Or are they genuinely rare and localised? Yeah. And we, we take it for granted that we know so much about birds and plants and butterflies and so on that, you know, we say, oh, you know, we need to protect swallowtails, we need to protect places in Norfolk that have got swallowtail butterflies um, or, or marsh harriers or, or, or whatever, stone curlies. Um, but there's 550 species here that we don't really know which are the things that might be deserving of protection yeah um and and there are many other groups of insects like that and does that mean we just say oh well we won't bother trying to protect them you know is it, we don't need to worry about conservation of these species just because we don't know anything about them or or you know i, I tend to sort of think oh no let's try and find something out about them at least as the first step exactly having yeah. said that yes there are some that because they've clearly got a uh, a preference for certain plants uh, they 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 but inevitably have a preference for certain sort of habitats um there's one that i'm quite interested in actually it's not yet on the norfolk list but i know it's known from salt marshes um from rushes on the edge of salt marshes and it's known from essex and suffolk and it's known from yorkshire and it's not yet known from norfolk but it must be in norfolk because yeah. that's the biggest expanse of salt marsh and um, so it's one that i need to make a, a special effort for sort of one spring um, I was going to try this year, but obviously we've had various issues this year of not getting out um, to go and find this thing because it must be all along the North Norfolk coast uh, and, uh, and at Braden Water. But I just haven't had a chance to go look for it yet. <laughs> right. And I'm sure knowing you, you will. 
I'll try to. Yeah, I'll try to one of these days. <laughs> yeah, and if it's there, knowing you, you'll find it. Well, it's probably it, it's probably quite easy to find if you actually just go to the right habitat at the right time of year. Yeah, too but nice. it's a small. It's a small dark insect, and um, you know you wouldn't notice these things unless you're really looking for them. Yeah, yeah. So what we'll do, we're, there's a few sort of species coming up. We'll we'll just have a, a, a sort of quick chat about a few individual species. Yeah, and then, then, then we'll we'll come on to your sort of map and we'll have a talk around the map. So yeah. so what what's this one first of all? Well, this, 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 oh, um, this is Aglia stigma fulvipes. I don't know if that's how you pronounce Aglia stigma, but fulvipes is probably right. Um, it's quite a common thing. It appears uh, it feeds on um, cleavers uh, and, and other bed straw species. And, and cleavers is obviously an incredibly abundant plant. Uh, it's um, you know that sort of sticky one that you get growing in sort of hedgerows um, uh, alongside nettles and other things. There's two species of these. Um, Acuparii comes out a little bit earlier on average, sort of March, April, and this comes out more April and May. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, half centimetre long, maybe six or seven millimetres. Um, reasonably easy to identify. I can I could usually identify with this from a photo if you sent me a photo of it. Um, so yeah, quite a widespread thing. Photograph this one in the garden. Uh, which it's an interesting point. I'll, I'll move on to sort of the, whatever that is. We'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, <laughs> we'll move on to that. But um, in fact, I tell you what, we'll move on to all oh, that. Yeah. yeah, let's move on to that. But before we do, um, You've mentioned earlier on you need sort of specialist equipment, so microscope and stuff like that. To what extent? So me as a layman, if I didn't have a microscope, um, I have, but it's at work. <laughs> but if I, if I didn't have one, how many species could I comfortably, or not how many species, but yeah. you know, would, would I get away with identifying a, a few without a microscope yeah. or equipment? Well, again, we're, we're sort of, developing on this you know traditionally these have been studied by sort of classic entomologists who caught caught everything and examined everything under the microscope now of course you know we've got at our disposal you know far better um photography uh, you know, photographic equipment you know the, the, these cameras indeed cameras even on mobile phones now will take respectable photos of some saw flies that will then be identifiable by showing them to um, somebody knowledgeable who can sort of help you with that. Um, a lot of species still are of the smaller sort of more obscure sort of groups that really do need a specimen to be taken and examined under the microscope and indeed I've got quite a lot of specimens that I still don't know what they are even when I look at them under the microscope because the yeah. books aren't there aren't books you know, the, the, the identification knowledge is still being developed. So we're still at that sort of cutting edge. But, you know, uh, you could get uh, several dozen species easily of uh, reasonably colourful, reasonably sort of sizable things you could photograph. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's that's good. Um, I can see what's happening here, uh, which if I were a male and I was sort of mating with a female that had a saw at the back end, I would a bit, be a bit worried. Um, what, what species is this? So this is this is an interesting one, and indeed it relates to the the, the photo on the previous slide. But let's talk about this. Um, what's going on here? There seems to be a lot of wings involved. This is actually a threesome. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, but yeah, this is this is two males attempting to to mate with a female. This is a little thing um, called Blenacampa, Blenacampa filicolpa. It you could give this the English name of the rose leaf rolling sawfly. Um, it's very common in my garden and it's yeah. very widespread. Yeah, and, and if we go back there, this is a rose in my garden. Uh, yeah. You'll notice the leaflets have been rolled up, sort of rolled down into a tight curl. And yeah. that, that a lot of people look at that and think that's, a, you know, um, a disease or maybe it's a reaction to somebody spraying pesticide on it or something like that. And it's not. This is a, 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 a reaction of the leaf to the to the insect. It might be a, you might call it a gall. I'm not sure if it's technically a gall or if it's a turning of the leaf. But anyway, the leaf has done something. Yeah. So the, 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 the saw flies are very small. These are sort of about three millimeters long. Little black things, pale legs. Um, they will lay their eggs on the rows. The rows will make that curl. And then the larvae of the sawfly lives inside the curl. So it's protected again from from a, a blue tick coming along to eat it uh, and, and so on. This is again is once you've got your eye in for that that curled leaf is quite an easy thing to record. It's not just on garden roses. It's a, it, it can be seen on wild roses in hedgerows and, and, and wherever. So 
Uh, you're when I'm out and about, this is this is one of the easier species to sort of confirm that is is in a location because that that sort of killed mine, uh, killed not in mine, killed leaf is 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 diagnostic. Yeah, and it, it, looking at the pattern on the wing there, is, mm. I mean that's almost like a pterostigma in a, in a an acosta in a, a dragonfly. Yeah, um, you know, it, would that be diagnostic in this species? So wing the, the pattern of veins in the wing is actually really important in sawflies, and if you want to take forward the identification of them, um, we've probably got clearer ones elsewhere. As I say, <laughs> this is a bit atypical because there's two males sort of on top of each yeah. other here almost. But um, but yeah, I mean maybe we'll, let, let's go through some more. I think that we might find one, but but certainly um, the pattern of veins in the wing is is one of the things that helps you start subdividing these 550 species into into smaller groups, into subfamilies and and tribes and and, and down to genus level. Sure, sure. And, and it's funny you should mention that. So here we are looking at sort of you know the veins in uh, sort of small sawflies, mm. and here this must be. A tiny sawfly good luck with looking at the veins in that so that probably a classic example of where you need at least a, a magnifying glass yeah i mean what i tend to use if if, if you're you know many naturalists and, and the most common group of naturalists are bird watchers of course um have binoculars and uh, the easiest way to magnify something is to turn your binoculars upside down and look at them backwards yeah uh, and and although i have a, a nice sort of magnifying lens in my pocket i i tend to just use my binoculars backwards most of the time because i've got them around my neck anyway um and you know for for having a quick look at something uh, that is that's that's all you need so if you've got binoculars you have a decent magnifying glass already even if you don't realize it yeah yeah so, yeah they, they look amazing ones then they, they're yeah. sort of very very wasp like i mean that the one in the top the, the, the top sort of center that's got the yellow line down it um this, yeah is, is that that's just where the petal so it's not showing a thin waist it's basically just part of uh, the petals yeah, all yeah that, that's just the, the effect of the petal there yeah so this is a really common sawfly at the moment um uh, if you're anywhere near a, a field of wheat um or probably other sort of um, cereal crops as well and indeed wild grasses but particularly wheat fields if you find a wheat field and find a flower next to it particularly yellow flowers like dandelions and buttercups but also hogweed now that hogweed's in flower you'll find this it, this is called cephas well, there's two species of cephas the common one cephas pygmaeus but cephas spinopage is common too um and these are um an interesting sort of group they're, they're actually a, a pest and um i suspect some of the i don't know i need to read up on this i suspect some of the pesticides that are sprayed on wheat are probably to try and deal with these mm. what these do is they lay their eggs in the stem of the grass or the wheat wheat's obviously a type of grass um and then the larvae of these actually feed inside the stem so instead of feeding inside a leaf they're feeding inside the stem um and this has been known since sort of um, you know historical times as a as a problem for for farmers, because although while the at first the the the, the wheat seems sort of um, fairly unaffected by this and you wouldn't notice it because you can't see this from the outside, what happens then is the wind blows and all the stems break and fall over because they've been weakened from the inside, yeah. um, so it can cause a bit of a problem to to farmers if if these get into to, to big numbers and they do get into big numbers you know this this is not an unusual uh site on a dandelion by a wheat field uh, at this time of year so again if i'm wandering around trying to find at least one sawfly in an area that this at the moment this is one of the easiest ones to find right okay i'll go look for that tomorrow <laughs> oh <clears throat> so here's a nice one called dolorous or dolorous puncticollis there's about 30 species of dolorous although not many have red on the legs again there let, let's just look we can see the veins in the wings yeah uh, and because i'm used to looking at these uh, i can see that this is probably um a dolorous because of the shape of some of the veins in the wing there and there's one in particular that sort of curls back on its it, on itself that really helps sort of um tell tell me this is a dolorous otherwise it you know it's, it's, it's a chunky sort of black sawfly with sort of silvery sort of hairs on it these the this is a, a group of common sawflies around rushes and and grasses uh and some on sedges and horsetails as well um 
quite an early flying groups some of them are out in march um quite common in april and, and, and different species into may and june um a lot of the sawfly larvae that you find in if you if you run just sort of bash a, a sort of heavy net against sort of grasses and sedges and rushes you'll find caterpillars as it were and a lot of them are a sawfly a, a, a larvae of dolorous like this and they're probably quite an important food source for, nice. for you know birds and, and things This is a nice, nice, colourful beast. This is um, Macrophia punctum album. This is a nice one to look for if you've got a privet hedge. So it feeds on privet, probably prefers wild privet, but I might get on garden privet as well. Um, doesn't seem to be fly for a long period of the year, but it's certainly out about now. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it's got these really long hind legs. The Macrophia um, sawflies have these really long hind legs, but this is the only one with this this precise combination of red and, and black and white. So uh, yeah, a really nice one to look at if you've got a got some privet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it is really smart that one. They're, they're really nice. Yeah, this is another another macrophyra. I found this yesterday um, while I was out. And it's, it's a bit not a great picture because it's, it's in a glass pot here, but this is macrophyra blander. Um, we don't know much about this. There's some indication it might be quite a rare one, but I found a few now. So maybe it's not maybe it's not rare in southeast norfolk i don't know um but again we're, we're still mapping out the location the, the distributions of these things right this is, this is quite nice this this is a, a relative of, of the cephas that we saw on the dandelion earlier the wheat feeders this this is um what's it called philoecus uh xanthostoma um uh, it feeds on meadow sweet so it's meadow sweet sort of quite a common sort of sort of scrubby sort of low growing plant in, in wet areas um and uh, i photographed well, I, I found this individual um just on 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 the cop the wet common the other side of the road from from my garden um this is a female you can just about see the the saw sticking out the back um or the saw sheath which covers the saw um i I found this, as I say, this year, I found a male of this species two years earlier at the same site, and they're currently the only definite records for Norfolk of this species, but it's probably quite widespread in all damp areas. Yeah. Uh, just just not, not commonly encountered. It's quite a striking yes. thing. Yeah, how big is that? Uh, this is a bit big. It's probably about a centimetre long. Yeah, that because that's really nice. I don't really yeah. like that. Yeah, the nice things. <sighs> that's gorgeous that's, yeah, that's amazing a, this is a bit of a beast this is this is a bit bigger it's probably about 14 mil long something like that uh, which doesn't sound a lot but but it is you notice these on a hedgerow so this is um tenthredo maculata so tenthredo is, is a group of, of some of the bigger ones maculata means spotted i think um it it can be found along hedgerows in in may and june um i haven't seen any the last last few times i've been out so it might be over this year uh, but it's a real chunky beast. This is one that I suspect if you held it carefully in your hand, it would probably have a go at your finger and, and give you a bit of a nip. Um, right. Um, but yeah, they're, they're sort of quite attractive. Again, look, you can just see the, the veins in the wing there and the pattern of the veins in the wing helps you get it down to um, which subfamily of sawfly it's in at, at the very least. Another thing you can see quite nicely here that's worth noting um, is the antennae. So if you, the antennae at the front, they're made up of different segments. Mm -hmm. It's hard to count exactly how many segments there, but take it, take my word for it, there's nine segments. There's two little ones at the base and then another seven makes up nine. Um, sawflies, big colourful sawflies like this are often mistaken for ichneumon wasps, which you get superficially similar black and yellow things of about a similar size. Ichneumons have a lot more um antennal segments they, they they often have 30 40 50 sometimes 60 segments right. uh, so lots of really fine sort of segments and so if you if you're uncertain um whether you've got a, a colorful sawfly or an ichneumon then that the number of antennal segments is really useful to sort of check yeah right you did mention maps and i did have got a map so my, my favorite live map as it were <laughs> Oh, this is a live. Well, it's obviously not live in this picture, but this is a live map. So this is where people can record their their Pretty sightings. Much live. So, so what this is? I, I, this is a map I'm I'm sort of keeping up to date. This is all the records of sawflies I've managed to amass yet for Norfolk from 18 
for the 1880s till uh, the present day, well, till yesterday, actually. Um, so the red squares are anywhere that I've had a um, record of a saw fly uh, until last year. And the blue ones are the ones I've added so far this year. And the, the, the ones this year are, are my efforts. I haven't gathered records yet from anybody else this year. Um, so you can tell where I live broadly. Um, yeah. And um, I've sort of made myself a little project to sort of um, get out and about and try and it, 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 it's, it's a reason to go and have a walk really is to sort of go and visit a new one kilometer square and try and find at least one sawfly in it um and as i say there's there's probably 350 species of sawfly in norfolk so finding one species isn't isn't perhaps massively um ambitious um but some of these places are quite boring bits of habitat to walk through um and again what i the, the thing that I'm interested in is trying to get this baseline of what are the common species so that we then actually start to be able to say something about if we if we think some species are rare, then at least we've got a baseline of what the common ones are. So as you see, I've, I've sort of been working on this sort of quadrant quadrant of southeast Norfolk, um, sort of between the Yare and the Waveney and, and the River Tass. Um, uh, and yeah, sort of moving sort of I live just south of Norwich, um, in the village of Shotsham, and sort of moving down towards the uh, the, the, the southern border of Norfolk. Um, you can also see I, I work in Thetford at the BTO, so I, the last few years I've been collecting a few records around the Brex as well, but there's a lot more to do there. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got a scatter from other recorders in the Broads uh, along the north coast and, and sort of some of the, the better recorders out, recorded areas elsewhere. But if you live in the, if you live in the Fens, I want you to record sawflies. Hey, do you know what? I was just about to ask. So how can people get involved in this? Because, you, you know, the recording any species is really important. Um, is there a citizen science project around this or is it purely submit uh, their recordings to yourself? So what I, what I, I, I would like people, if, if you know what you've seen or think you know what you've seen, I'd like you to put your records on iRecord. I record's the best place to put records sort of overall for most of these groups. Um, you can type I record into Google or, or other search engines are available and um, and you'll find it. So you can register and you can put your records in. I won't go into details how you do that because there's loads of details on there. Um, and those records will find their way to me or if it's in another county, they'll find the records to, to other recorders. Um, it, alternatively, if you prefer to sort of um, you, my um, contact details are on the website of the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society as one of the county recorders, so you can you can find me that way. Obviously, as I've been saying throughout, not a lot of people know a lot about sawflies, including including me. <laughs> you know, there's so much still to learn. So actually, the best way to to get involved really is probably to take photos of things and to go onto Facebook, and then there is a a sawflies uh, group on Facebook. Post your photos on there and uh, I and other people will see them and we'll try and give you advice on what they are or, or what you might need to look for to to sort of um, improve the chances of uh, finding them. Uh, there's a Norfolk Wildlife Facebook as, uh, group as well which is is also you know a good place to post things and that I'm active on as well but if you go if, if you're really interested in the sawfly then post it on the Norfolk Wildlife Facebook group uh, sorry the sawfly Facebook group and that's where the you know a lot of the national expertise sort of hangs out and can help you and that's probably your best way in brilliant well i'll put links to yourself yeah. and all sorts underneath the video um and then also i'll remind people of the the facebook sites that you've mentioned because i think i'm i'm in the both groups so yeah. um brilliant okay so that is sort of a lot of your work um a lot of other people's work the blue ones are this year um, so looking at it, I'm just trying to work out where I would be and whether I should nip out and <laughs> do some. Yeah, sawfly. we've got some squares around you that need 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 sawfly records. So yeah, <laughs> any yeah. records, any record of a sawfly is useful. As I say, we don't have many. Um, so um, any record of any sawfly, however common, uh, is useful. I, I record the same things every day in the garden just to get a feel for some of the, you know, the period of the year that these things are flying because we don't have that information for lots of species very, very sort of precisely yet. Or we yeah. might have something that was written down 100 years ago. And as we know, lots of things are changing as, you know, as the climate warms up. So any record of any sawfly is useful. 
Right. Okay. And yeah, so clearly, you know, recording speed is really good, obviously helps with the conservation. So before we end, I mean, this is a fantastic picture, so you can talk us through that in one second. But before we end, yeah, we've got to record sawflies just like we've got to record everything else. Why? As in, when I say that, what, and th this is, you know, me playing sort of devil's advocate. Why are they important? Why is a sawfly important? Why is anything, why is, why is a swallowtail butterfly important, really? You know, it looks colourful to human eyes, but, you know, so what sort of thing? Yeah. You know, why, why, why are any of these things important? Um, sawflies, they're, they are, an, I, I think they're, they're an important part of um, most ecosystems. If you like, if you're just interested in, you know, what they do for other species, you know, they, they're very, very abundant sort of um, things that eat plants and then get eaten by other things. So birds, wasps, spiders, whatever. It's an important part of the uh, of, of food webs, really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but but there's, there's 550 species, of them, so similar number to the number of birds ever recorded in Britain. Uh, and we, we don't know a lot about them yet. So there's there's a lot to learn. Sold. And apart from that, the more people that can get out there and identify them, the more of a headache they can give you by sending you photographs of human wasps and saying, is this yeah. one? Yeah, oh yeah, and don't yeah. worry, um, you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm going to have to go and look because I've got folders with unidentified pictures in and one's human wasps and the other one's sawflies and I'll bet you that there's the wrong ones in each. Right. Um, talk us, because this is a great picture, I love this picture, it's really, really good. Yeah, so this is what we've seen already. You know, the, the, this is the dolorous uh, puncticollis. Um, I was I was really playing playing with this because they're quite difficult um, to identify, and I'm, I'm and traditionally you have to kill them and look at a, a, at a pin specimen. I'm sort of really interested in trying to sort of work out how to identify them live, and they don't just tend to sit on your fingers like this. So I put this one in the fridge for about four minutes, right. um, which was enough enough to cool it down enough to sit still on my finger so i could look at the the relevant bits um but not too long that it, it wouldn't sort of recover and it, it flew off about one second after this photo was taken um so it's really hard to identify some of these things um but we are trying to make progress in in IDing from li live insects IDing from photographs where possible and sort of really pushing forward the boundaries well, there that was an amazing introduction uh we've uh, we've actually beaten the hour I did say we'll talk for as long as it needs, and it, it's needed over an hour, and I'm sure we could talk for another hour. Oh, we um, can't, because my tea's ready and my family are waving at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I did warn you. Andy, thanks ever so much. That that was a really sort of great yeah. overview of, of, of probably a not very well-known group of, of, sort of, well, obviously not flies, but yeah. So thanks ever so much for your time. And um, I'll leave you to your tea and to your recording. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Alan. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Andy. Take care. See you soon. See Thanks. Ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.